Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts webinar broadcast. We hope everyone is staying safe and staying well. Whether you are taking part in the live webinar today or listening to the webinar replay or podcast a few days or weeks from now, today's topic, coping strategies for adults living on the autism spectrum in these uncertain times, is important, timely, and helpful. Before we get started, let me note a couple of housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into the live webinar may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources tab of your webinar screen. For new information on how to purchase the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you receive directly at the end of the webinar. For those of you listening to the broadcast in replay or podcast mode, please log on to the webinar replay page on the Attitude website. And the URL for that is www.attitudemag.com slash webinar slash adults hyphen with hyphen autism for access to both the accompanying slides and the certificate of attendance option. So for today's topic, no one is immune to the disruptions and changes brought on by this global pandemic. For adults on the autism spectrum, the loss of routines and expectations is especially damaging, often leading to seemingly insurmountable anxiety. For those of all ages throughout the autism spectrum, support from family and care team, care team members is critical to easing the transition from established routines to new ones, whether that be at school, at home, and at the workplace. The good news is that Dr. Stephen Shore will provide autistic adults with strength-based tactics for keeping in touch with others, improving self-regulation, planning alternate ways to meet needs and achieve goals, and suggestions for self-care. He will give us practical solutions for coping and thriving as a person on the autism spectrum during this unsettled time. Stephen is a full-time professor at Adelphi University an adjunct professor at NYU Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development, a current board member of Autism Speaks and the Organization for Autism Research, President Emeritus of the Asperger Autism Network, and advisory board member of the Autism Society. Dr. Schur also serves on the advisory boards of AANE and other autism-related organizations. You can ask questions of Stephen during his presentation, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can after he finishes it. That all be, being said, I'll turn it over to Dr. Shore. Thanks so much for being here today, Stephen. Oh, well, thank you, Wayne, for uh, bringing me on board. It's a pleasure and an honor to be presenting for Attitude today. And we're going to focus on how autistic adults can cope and thrive uh, during uncertain times. And we're certainly in a period of uncertainty at this point, uh, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's politically, and a whole host of other uh, vectors which are giving us challenges. So let us begin with what brings me here to talk to you. Taking it from the beginning, uh, things were pretty typical at first. At 24 hours of age, my wife says I looked like an egg. And then at 18 months, like what happens to about 30% of us on the autism spectrum, what I call the regressive autism bomb exploded. And for us, that means after 18 to 24 months, a loss of uh, of communication, meltdowns from the environment, withdrawal from the uh, and withdrawal from the environment, and self-stimulatory behavior. So in brief, I became a pretty autistic little kid. There was so little known about autism in those days. So little known that it took my parents a full year to find a place for diagnosis. And when they did, the doctor said, "Well, this kid is so sick." 
uh, I think you should send them to an institution. And in those days, that was the protocol or the expectation prognosis for a person on the autism spectrum, that they would get sent off to an institution and they wouldn't really be able to do really do anything with their life. Unfortunately, my parents, like we see so many parents today, they advocated on my behalf and they convinced the school to take me in about a year. And it was during those years, that year, that my parents implemented what we would today refer to as an intensive home-based early intervention program. And this was a program emphasizing music, movement, sensory integration, narration, and imitation. And with the work that they did, speech began to return at age four. I believe that we have the technology, we have the know-how, we have the wherewithal so that autistic people, and we can generalize that to those with ADD and with various other conditions, um, what we can do is that instead of focusing on where does it come from, more of the question is, what can we do with autism? And in that way, ignoring the closed doors of deficit disorder and disability and look at the open doors of ability. And rather than becoming a bomb, autism becomes the bomb. And so the autistic people I know who have become successful and the bomb, you might say, it's those of us where people have advocated for us and provided supports in the early years. And again, this generalizes to other conditions as well. And in that way, lay the path for leading a fulfilling and productive life. So for me, speech began to return at age four. I entered the school that initially rejected me. I got reevaluated. Instead of being considered a psychotic, I got upgraded to neurotic. So things were looking better in the world. We often hear about highly focused interests of autistic individuals. Well, I was found at age four taking apart a watch with a sharp knife. I'd pop open that watch. I'd extract the motor. I'd remove some of the gears, play with them, spin them around, and then put it all back together again. And the watch still worked. And there weren't any pieces left over. So one thing I was always curious about is uh, how could I have the fine motor control to take apart a watch, not even using the right tool, well, it was a complete disaster area when it came to penmanship, fine motor control. And often that's something in common that many of us share with those having ADD or ADHD and various other conditions. And I think what that tells us is it's an example of the sharp lines of demarcation between the abilities that these differences give us and the disabilities that come with autism and various other conditions. So I like to focus on what the autistic person can do, but also keeping in mind the, that we need to be realistic and address the challenges that exist, or otherwise the, we wouldn't be here trying to figure things out for those of us on the autism spectrum and those of us with various other uh, conditions. So. How does this play out into uncertain times, and especially now with the COVID-19 pandemic, where I would have been stuck at home and not going to school? Well, it brings to mind the big three, which I think are good, is good for autistic individuals and good for everybody else. And what I mean by this big three is... Uh, well, here's a picture of uh, some of the watches that I might have taken apart at that time. Uh, the big three. The big three is, first, we need to maintain routines as they were, as much as possible. So those are the routines at home. Those are the expectations that we do at home. And certainly, we're no longer leaving home and going to school anymore. So what adjustments can we make? to assure the routines 
are as much the same as possible. So in my situation, maybe that would have meant having pictures uh, on the wall, schedules that would show when I get up, what do I need to do, having breakfast, then going into the bathroom and washing up and getting ready for school, all of that remains the same. And now instead of maybe having a picture of a bus or an expectation of getting on a bus, now we go to a certain area of the house. It might be a room. It might be a corner of the room. It might even just be a desk where schoolwork is going to take place. So that's just one example of maintaining the routines that we can and then adjusting when needed. <laughs> and in school, certainly, there are certain things. There, there are thing, things that happen there as well. So, for example, uh, there tends to be some sort of uh, attendance in the morning, maybe an opening circle, or maybe before the workday starts for the parents. And if there's other children at home, they you know, they get into their schoolwork. We can all kind of gather together and recognize that. All right, now we are in school, or at least getting schooling at this point. It's time to learn, and everybody's present and accounted for, and we carry on with our day, complete with the mid-morning snack and lunch and so on. Clear communication. Communicate in the best way the person you're supporting. Communicate. So with many of us, it's word-based communication, like I'm engaging in now, However, for others, it may be with pictures. It may be with words on a wall. However, that person communicates, let's use that means of communication. And then there's the self-care piece. That's the third part of the big three, self-care. You need to take care of yourself so that you can then be available to support the person with a disability who you're supporting. And if you are an autistic person who's listening, person with ADD or some other condition, then we can generalize that to what are you going to do to take care of yourself? And sometimes it's just as simple as taking a short break. And one example of such a short break is just to stop what you're doing and inhale. Slowly breathe in. When you breathe in, you think about inhaling calm from the universe, from the environment. And then when you exhale slowly, you're exhaling all the stress out of your body. You do this three times, and you'll most likely be quite relaxed. And this is something you can do for yourself. This is something that you can teach the person who you're supporting to do as well. Uh, often, well, I guess we don't fly anymore, but when we used to fly in airplanes, I certainly spent a lot of time in airplanes as I was traveling to about one foreign country a month, one international trip a month to talk about autism. I got it up to about 51 countries, and I look forward to increasing that count when it becomes safe to travel again. So anyways, on that airplane... As we're getting ready for takeoff, flight attendants have the safety uh, uh, demonstration where they talk about if the oxygen mask can come down from the ceiling, you put your mask on first before you help the person next to you. And the reason why is that if you don't, you probably pass out before you can get to helping that other person. You haven't taken care of yourself, so you're not available for yourself or the other person, which is why you have to take care of yourself first. So that's the first um, self-care hint. We've got a couple of others as we continue on. So then in grade school, that was a social and academic catastrophe. You know what happens to people who are different in grade school. Fortunately, school systems realize that bullying is not a developmental phase that people need to go through. And um, academically, you know, I was about a grade behind in most of my subjects, spending most of my time in the back of the room in a sort of, I guess, a geographical inclusion situation, just reading all the books on my favorite subjects, taking notes and 
copying diagram. And this went pretty much all through elementary school, middle and high school were better. You don't need to be autistic to have difficulties in middle and high school. But for me, my interest in music carried me through and I became so fascinated in music that I got it into my autistic head that I needed to learn how to play all the instruments. Hours in the instrument closet, figuring out how they worked. Well, I didn't learn them all. I got it up to about 15. And then when I heard of the requirement for degree in music education was that you had to learn all the instruments, well, that just seemed to be the way to go. So on to college, all the way through my doctoral degree, and where I then had more friends, courses were more interesting, bullies kind of fell away. College is also where I met my wife, and we've been uh, married now for just a little over 30 years. And if you want to find out more about what life is like on her side of the autism spectrum, you can read her contributions to beyond my autobiography, Beyond the Wall. And I spend most of my time now in what might be considered a sheltered workshop for people with Asperger's syndrome, where we perseverate on topics for months and years and force people to listen to us. Sometimes uh, community, sometimes social interaction between community members could be improved. Some people refer to this place as a university. So getting back to the recommendation of the professionals when I was initially diagnosed at two and a half, the recommendation of institutionalization, I guess in some ways they were correct, but maybe what they didn't take into account was the fact that I'd be in an institution of higher education as a professor at Adelphi University. So moving on, what are some, you might say, 10 ways to cope when your normal routines are disrupted, whether it's you or whether you're supporting somebody? And remaining connected with family, friends, support people, and others uh, who are important to you, that's a big one. And while we can't, uh, while we now are restricted to very little face-to-face -face contact, there are protocols for that, but it takes a lot of work, and it isn't as satisfying as what we're used to just being with other people. We should still do it. So making use of the phone social media, um, FaceTime, whatever it is, remain connected and make sure anybody you support is also remaining connected. And as you remain connected, it's also important to keep from fusing with others. What I mean by that, emotional fusing. One thing that's common with autism is, um, well, there is a myth that we don't perceive other people's emotions. I think it's actually the other way around based on my experiences as an autistic person and others I know, where perhaps we experience those emotions a little bit too much and we get overwhelmed and maybe shut down. So if you're feeling a little bit more anxious than you think you should be, might it be that you're, uh, you're absorbing like a sponge this anxiety from others maybe from TV, maybe from talking to people. doesn't mean that you stop doing these things, but it means you recognize it, and then you're able to work with it. Plan A is gone. My plan A was to be traveling to a different country every month and doing a lot of workshops and presentations and teaching at my university, at Delphi University. Well, that got blown out of the water, we, we got ejected from our campus on March 9th. I've been home since March 10th. So what's plan B? Plan B is to do all of my work online, just as I am doing this webinar right now. It's different than plan A. I miss plan A, but plan A is not an option at this time. And plan B, we can do a pretty good work uh, sticking with plan B. So developing plan Bs and differentiating between the two and when it becomes safe to engage in extended um, in, uh, personal contact with others, then we go back to plan A. Now, that said, 
developing these online plan Bs are going to be very helpful to me and I'm sure many others so that perhaps you don't always need to go to the office to work five days a week. And as a matter of fact, we're seeing a big crash in real estate uh, values in Manhattan and probably many other cities as large companies who have built their companies around and their organizations around these massive, tall office buildings, expecting people to be there five days a week from nine to five. We've also learned that a lot of this work we can do at home. And maybe companies don't need to support these massive offices anymore. So that might end up being a permanent change. We'll find out. The outside can be very restorative. Make sure you get outside. Be safe when you do so. Bring masks and gloves and maintain good, proper, and I prefer to use the term physical distance. We talk about social distancing. And what that says to me is that we want to become more like hermits and withdraw from interactions with others, which is exactly what we shouldn't be doing. But what we should be doing is making sure that we maintain a safe physical distance. Uh, Six feet seems to be the most commonly heard number that I hear. So get outside, walk, ride your bike, whatever you do outside, do it when you can. It's a beautiful day outside. I am inside, but at least I'm looking out the window and I can see the wonderful outside and that helps a lot. It's also important to realize that keeping safe during this pandemic requires a lot more cognitive energy. So say you have, as my friend Dina Gasner, from where I got a lot of this information from, she talks about a cognitive rain barrel. I mean, it gets filled up with tap. It gets drained out. Um, it, can get, uh, it gets drained out by things you have to do, things that require cognitive energy, um, now, for example, instead of just going outside and driving to the store, it's a whole big plan. You have to think about uh, getting a mask, gloves, proper social distancing when you're in the store, if you can get in the store at all, perhaps waiting in line outside of the store, and many things that you have to do in order to remain safe in this uncertain time. So we may not have as much energy to put to our work, whether it's school work or working uh, as an employee for an organization. So what are some sources for support? I figured I'd throw up a few sources here. Uh, here's a wonderful story, the social story that talks about the coronavirus. There's many other resources on this website as well. There's a link here that you can click on and you can check it out on your own. And in this case, it's a social story explaining in easy-to-understand language uh, for people to understand uh, what we're working with. And this can also give you ideas to generalize for other situations as well. Education, that's a big thing. Parents have inadvertently become their children's teachers, and there's dozens, I think now hundreds, of companies, educational companies that are offering free materials and subscriptions due to the school physical closing that can be used to help you support your child, your child's learning. And for those of you who are educators, you can go in there too, and there are many resources that can be helpful for supporting your teaching students online. What else is there? Uh, here's another organization, relatively new organization, Learn Autism. I'm proud to be a part of this organization because it focuses on parent-driven, research-based uh, information. So they have these short, very helpful videos, about two minutes, because sometimes that's all the attention span that we have during these difficult times, and little snippets and bites of information that can be helpful right now to help you support uh, your child on the autism spectrum. If you have a child with another condition, maybe there are some things that can, you can uh, generalize from this to your situation. 
back to education as I am in Ireland. Uh, they have a lot of good information on getting support from uh, for coping and thriving during COVID-19, which again can be generalized to other uh, other uncertain times as well. So we get to the big three. It's time to take another break. Again, maintaining routines and adjusting when needed. One routine that comes to mind for myself uh, has to do with movement. I need to be much more mindful of my movement. What I mean by that is uh, typically get up in the morning, ride my bicycle to work, get a certain amount of exercise, and then while at work, I get a certain amount of exercise walking from one office to another, walking to the classes where I teach, even just standing and sitting while teaching my classes. And now all of this work has been confined to a small room in my house, uh, which is extremely convenient, but it also means sitting for hours on end and not getting up. So what that translates to is the adjustment I have to make is to make sure I get sufficient exercise. Fortunately, I have an elliptical bike at home, so I make sure I spin that for at least an hour every other day. On the days that I'm not on the elliptical bike, there are various other exercises that can be done. Now, for others, uh, you could go outside. You could get your exercise and outside time at the same time. Those of you who like to walk, like to jog, or ride your bicycle, uh, these are some things that you can do. Maybe you need to be a little bit more mindful now because you're doing less of it incidentally during the day and you have to just carve out time to make sure that it's done. And as we continue with communication, making sure that we're clear in our communication, we should be clear in our communication uh, all the time anyways, whether there's a pandemic or not. And then maintaining self-care, which uh, my exercise routine is a form of self-care. Yeah, you could also take a short yoga break. And this is a strategy where you breathe in, slowly you clench your fist. And when you breathe out, you release and open your hands. Do that three times. And if you need a little bit more, you can do the same thing with pressing your hands together in a prayer position on the, uh, when you're breathing in, on the inhalation. When you exhale, you spread the hands apart. So as we continue, uh, here's uh, five more ways. Often I hear parents and even autistic people saying, well, it seems like my child's regressed or I've regressed. Suddenly doing these things that I haven't done in years. I haven't spun a spinner in a couple of years, but now I'm carrying this thing around. Now I seem to be spending more time knitting or my child has this, old stuffed cat that she gave up years ago. Uh, But now suddenly she's carrying them around again. And while we may think of this as regression or self-stimulatory behavior in the autism world, really what they are is self-regulatory or coping action. So give yourself permission to do these things or if uh, you're supporting someone, maybe this is something that they need to do. Uh, so those of us who are supporting others, maybe it's watching a TV series that we kind of gave up on, and now suddenly we have newfound interest, and we need to do that to relax. So go for it and do it and look at it as self-regulatory or coping behaviors. Take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. If it means you like to spend time in a warm bath with a rubber ducky, then that's just exactly what you do. And whatever you need to do to self-care, some of the strategies that I talked about, maybe you have some of your own. It's important more than ever to maintain personal health. So making sure that if you take medication, make doubly sure that you're Taking it on time, if you need a reminder, like this uh, pill organizer, you use one of those. Uh, Whatever you need to do in order to maintain that personal health and take your medication, if you are on medication, that needs to be done. Yesterday, I went to see my doctor for a physical examination. So 
don't put that off either unless it's unsafe to go. Well, the hospital practiced a good physical distancing hygiene, and as did the doctor, so I felt safe doing so. And it's always good to make sure that all the pipes and wires, the internal pipes and wires, are working. When you're going outside, bring gloves and masks as needed. Also bring as little as possible, because whatever goes outside has to be cleaned before it comes inside. So, for example, instead of just throwing my wallet in my pocket with my money, credit cards, driver's license, and who knows what else is in there, it's kind of scary to look inside, I slim down as much as possible. I pull out a $20 bill, maybe two of them. I pull out the credit card and the license, and then I'm ready to ready to go and I'm often driving to where I need to go and do whatever I need to do. No need to wear a mask while you're driving, but have it at the ready for when you get out. And likewise for gloves, it's important to realize that you may need uh, more than one mask and more than one pair of gloves. So bring as little as possible. If you don't have a mask, improvise. Maybe an old t-shirt or a bandana. I'm also now seeing that masks have become a sort of uh, fashion statement, so you could do that too. And then what do you do when you return home and accept items that are shipped in? We'll get to that in a little bit. Here are some more resources for supports. Survival kit written by an autistic person. Tips to maintain your mental and physical health. Some great ideas from someone who having the lived experience of being autistic. And likewise, there may be similar kits that are from people having other conditions. Uh, The next organization, a new organization, they've got a number of different webinars that you can watch. They're very helpful. One of them is how to structure your day, which I think is good for everybody. Uh, Often what is good for an autistic individual tends to be good for everybody else. The state of Qatar has come out with this nice infographic to help their citizens stay safe. And there are many other countries, states, cities, and location organizations that have developed um, helpful infographics just like this. Uh, Probably all you need to do is to go into Google Images and search for COVID-19 safety infographic, and you'll have more infographics than you know what to do with. Back to the big three. As we consider uh, maintaining our routines, communication, and self-care, sometimes as part of self-care, it's a matter of just breathing, really doing nothing else. And in that way, if we just let our thoughts float by without trying to stop or engage or judge them, that can be relaxing as well, especially if you're sitting outside or at least in a place where you can relax. So we're on, you know, we're looking at the uh, tenth way to cope and thrive when your normal coping routines are disrupted. And this has to do with your home. Uh, As I mentioned before, less is more. If you're going outside, take out take as little as possible because whatever you don't take outside doesn't need to be cleaned on the way in. Everything back that is brought into the house, we quar- disinfect and quarantine for 24 and sometimes up to 36 hours. Mail that comes through the mail slot just remains where it lands uh, for 36 hours, and then we open it up. Uh, when we receive packages, Uh, Likewise, they get quarantined. We get our food delivered. So that reduces the risk of going to a a grocery store and food that gets uh, delivered. There's a sink of warm, soapy water ready for the food that comes. Some things that can be washed, some things that don't wash well. Certainly you you could wash an orange, apples, and so on. Pasta, you can't really wash, but... That also can be safely quarantined just by leaving on a dedicated place on a counter uh, for 36 hours, three days, uh, however long you feel is safe. 
shoes, for example, have inside shoes and outside shoes. And that's what we do. We have a place near the door where we exchange one set or the other. Uh, some food, again, can't be quarantined. Uh, some food needs to be refrigerated right away. You can wash uh, a bottle of milk or a carton of milk, but you can't leave it out for 24 hours. It will go bad. Shower. So when we get home, uh, walk to the bathroom, drop the clothes on the floor, just leave them. It's a mess. Uh, you got to do that to remain safe. Let them stay for 24 hours to let any virus on them die. Scrub down in the shower just like you would anyways. Don't touch the clothes. Dry off. And now you're ready to interact with others in your home and do, do as needed. And that keeps your home safe as well. Feel free to reduce expectations. Getting back to the cognitive load cognitive energy that you need to expend in order just to remain safe, to engage in all the protocols that I've mentioned. So maybe you're not going to be doing as much homework, doing as much writing, or just being as productive as you thought you would be because there's so much else in which to concentrate on. And it's important just to give you self permission to know that, well, that's how things are going to be for now until either we get used to it or the pandemic lifts. So as we continue some more strategies, uh, going back to Ireland, uh, Middletown, COVID-19 Support and Resources Center for Autism, they've got a number of webinars, some similar to this one, and many, many others that can be helpful. And I'm also sure that there are analogous resources from organizations focusing on other conditions such as learning disabilities, ADHD, traumatic brain injury, or whatever, whatever it may be. Some more strategies, community heroes. Uh, this is a this is a nice book that's free. You can download it uh, or just uh, look at it online. And again, many things, many ideas, many protocols that you can follow in order to remain safe during these on. Un- certain time. A couple of big organizations, Autism Speaks and the Autism Society of America, both have webinars, toolkits, and all sorts of other information for remaining safe, coping, and being productive during these uncertain times. So these are some of the things that come to mind when I think about, number one, remaining safe, during these uncertain times, be it COVID-19, perhaps in the future there may be other situations like this, uh, maybe when a storm strikes, a hurricane or a snowstorm, and it's a little bit like that, except now it seems that it's more extended. I want to thank you for your participation. I uh, want to thank you for what you're doing to either support yourself if you're an autistic person or a person with another condition or if you're supporting others as a parent, teacher, manager, or other, in order so that we may remain safe, cope well, productive, and even thrive during these times. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was excellent. Um, it took a lot of comfort in your tips uh, and strategies. Um, lots of questions. Um, One woman has asked, I became almost frozen due to lack of routine. It took me weeks to overcome this and create a new routine. All the information, regulations, restrictions have bewildered and challenged me. Is this normal for a high-functioning autistic person? Um, uh, I would say uh, many uh, autistic people will be challenged in this way. And what has happened is that our world has been turned upside down and inside out. And all kinds of things that we assumed would be, suddenly they've changed. It feels like the rug has been pulled out from under you. And um, it's a very confusing time. And so uh, for an autistic person and maybe many others, uh, you start out slow. Stay in your house. Develop your own routine. Uh, keep the ones that you have the same. 
uh, probably your wake up routines and going to bed routines and making sure you keep good hygiene. Those routines, they all stay the same. Uh, meal times are probably still the same. Uh, you're going to have to make adjustments to get your food, whether it's ordering in, that's a possibility, or if you do have to go out uh, to a grocery store, uh, you take precautions. Now, what I know is that most, uh, I think most grocery stores have uh, set aside an hour in the morning before they open for people with disabilities, people uh, senior citizens and others who may be vulnerable at a time like this. So what I might consider is going to the store, if that's what has to be done, going to the grocery store during that senior hour, you might say. Now, you may not be a senior, but you have another reason for why you may need to go and at that time. And especially for us autistic people who are often averse to crowds anyways and like to have more space uh, in some strange sort of way, it's an actual benefit uh, for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we often at Attitude um, receive emails and letters, et cetera, about distinguishing between ADHD and autism. Uh, there's a, a healthy overlap. Uh, I wonder if you could give um, some steps on how to distinguish between the two. Well, the good news is that in 2013, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which has a number of conditions, including ADD, ADHD and autism, uh, caught up with reality and recognized that a person could be diagnosed with both. Uh, now, that said, there are some differences because they have uh, different uh, labels. And uh, the difference is, uh, actually, I'm not an expert in this area, but my sense is that some of the differences uh, probably relate to attention. Now, there's differences in attention with both autism and ADHD, but there are some subtleties between them which I seem to be able to recognize when I see it, but I haven't thought enough about it to really give a succinct answer. Okay. So that's my, like, non-answer answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh Someone has asked, is writing your feelings in a journal or, some, or somehow recording your day, day's experience, help with lowering your anxiety? Uh, with many people, that's a great strategy. And as I think about a common strategy for those who have a busy brain at night and they're thinking about all the things that they need to do the next day and it keeps them awake and makes them anxious, a common strategy is to write down a to-do list for tomorrow. And what that does is it offloads all of these tasks from your brain, and you're not worrying that you're going to forget them tomorrow because you wrote them down. So right. that can be extended to keeping a journal. A journal is a great way to help reduce anxiety. Mm -hmm. Someone wants to know, how do you define self-stim? I... I I like to think, well, the official definition, let's start with that. The official definition is repetitive, non-functional behavior. Now, that said, just about everybody I know engages in this type of behavior, whether it's bouncing your leg, uh, doodling, twirling your hair, biting the end of your pen, and so on. So what, is the per what are these people really doing? You ask the person, why are you bouncing your leg while you're doodling? And they'll think a while, and they'll probably come up with something similar to, it helps me concentrate. I don't know why, but it helps me concentrate, and I just need to do it. And if you tell them, well, you need to stop, maybe they'll stop for a while, but then it will just come right back. Now, with autistic people, these behaviors, what they do, just like for non-autistic people, these behaviors are more self-regulatory. Uh, self they either upregulate your brain so you don't fall asleep, or they downregulate because of repetitive motion uh, reduce anxiety. Now, for autistic people, 
due to the nature of how we are and the sensory issues, related sensory issues, we tend to be more dysregulated than the typical population. So what that means is that our attempts to regulate, be it rocking, flapping, or whatever it might be, they're going to be greater than what most others do in order to keep ourselves well-regulated. Uh, so as a result, uh, we need some strategy in case these actions are disrupted. So flapping, is there's nothing inherently wrong with flapping your hands, so why not do it? And you watch The Price is Right, for example, and there's an awful lot of flapping going on. <laughs> and I don't think those people are autistic. Uh, let's take it. Well, let's take it back to the classroom. If I have a student who is flapping their hands and it's disruptive, maybe I would just go to that student and hand them a squeeze ball, a therapy ball. And I would say, here, squeeze this. Because what I'm doing is I'm recognizing that that flapping is fulfilling a need. That need is going to be fulfilled whether you like it or not. If you tell the kids, stop, hands down, quiet hands, maybe they'll stop for a few moments then it's going to come back or something else is going to come back that will be even more difficult to deal with than the flapping. What I've often seen occupational therapists do is take Velcro, for example, the sticky side and the soft side, and stick them both underneath the desk. And then the student can run their fingers along that Velcro to get the sensory input that they need. So you can redirect behaviors if they are disruptive. You can't stop them. Mm. Uh, someone wanted to have more, have you explain further about the clear communication you mentioned in one of the earlier slides. They wanted more detail oh, on sure. that. Yeah. So why I, uh, what I'm focusing on is the idea of clear communication is that if it, you, you need to communicate in the best way the person understands and processes language. So for many of us who speak in order to communicate, talking just like this is perfectly fine. Uh, for others, we may need to minimize words. So for example, uh, here's another school type of example. Uh, uh, before you take your test, I want you to write your name by picking up your pencil. So that was a three-part instruction set. However, it's all out of order. And it will be much more helpful if I put it in order. Everybody pick up your pencils. Now write your name. Now start the test. So I put them in, in chronological order. So that's one example. And also mm -hmm. summarizing where possible and using bullets. And for others who don't speak, and I know many autistic people who don't speak, that you put them in front of a, an assistive communication device, and they're communicating just as well as we're communicating now. It might take them a little bit longer, and they communicate in a different way, but other than that, uh, I know many non-speaking autistic people who could easily give a presentation like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one's a little personal. My housemate is 25 and has Asperger's. He is challenged with chores, cleaning the house, personal hygiene, and picking up after his dog. How can I help him reach these goals? Well, one thing I would consider is putting together a schedule. Schedules are very helpful in, for keeping things in order and making things predictable. So if you have a housemate or even if you're just living with another person, and I've even seen people do this for themselves. They'll keep a schedule on the refrigerator or other location that lists what chores are done, with more than one people, by whom, and when they are to be done. So maybe one person is in charge of making sure all the trash goes out by Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. because the garbage truck comes at 8 o'clock. Maybe they actually take it out the night before. Uh, whether it's feeding pets, picking up after pets, uh, having schedules for that, and also having uh, visual schedules if that's needed uh, as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
what one woman asks, what if the autistic person is a senior, likes to go to stores to purchase something, then come home? Um, he uses the drive-by pharmacy. He, uh, he has routine, but he seems to need this going out, buy something kind of contact. Uh, I tell him to wear a mask, but what else can I do to protect him and myself? So it sounds like the person needs to get out for some reason or another. Right. So uh, for the person who just needs to get out, and I know some people are sick <laughs> or otherwise, who just need to get out. And what that means is developing protocols or going out safely. Uh, it sounds like he's wearing a mask, and that's good. That's a start. Mm -hmm. And then, depending on the situation, uh, it may be necessary to wear gloves. When I went to the hospital yesterday for my uh, annual physical, uh, the hospital uh, insisted that you wear their mask, not your mask. So if you were wearing a mask, you threw it out, washed your hands, and you put on their mask. But what I also noticed is that nobody wore gloves. There was a lot of hand washing, but nobody was wearing gloves. Everybody was making sure to keep six feet apart whenever possible. Uh, so the physical distancing rule, it's important to be aware of that. And also staying away uh, as much as possible from where there's crowds of people. Uh, due to and reduce the possibility of picking up the COVID-19 infection. For someone who's going out and doing drive-by pickups or even going into a store if it's not crowded, picking up a few items and maintaining a good uh, safety uh, protocol, then that's probably okay. Mm -hmm. This is a little different. Um, can you speak to the trend of people self-diagnosing autism? I have not heard of this for any other diagnosis. Um, it's an interesting trend. It's, I see there's good in it, but there's also danger. And I know people who have other conditions, such as ADHD and others, who have also self-diagnosed. Now, what I see self-diagnosis being use, useful for is uh, you read things on the internet or other material. You mm -hmm. take a few tests. Um, there's always questions as to the reliability because it's not in a controlled situation. But often you can get a pretty good idea if you're autistic or not. And that's great it's because uh, then you can learn more about yourself and what you can do to make yourself successful. Uh, some people just leave it at, at that. I know I have many colleagues, for example, who have self-diagnosed. They know they're autistic, but they don't feel a need to validate it with a formal uh, diagnosis. And they don't really talk about it that much, except to some people who understand that it's self-diagnosis and it helps them with learning about themselves. If it's important to validate that diagnosis, uh, perhaps due to curiosity, well, I want to see if this is really true, or if the person uh, needs some sort of support, perhaps at work or at school under a special education law, then you have to get that backed up by a formal diagnosis by a qualified professional. So my take on self-diagnosis, it's a great place to start, and if you understand the, you might say, threats to reliability and validity of doing the self-diagnosis, um, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. But you also have to be aware of the limitations of not getting a formal diagnosis. Mm -hmm. What suggestions do you have for couples where one member is high-functioning, has high-functioning Asperger's, and the other is neurotypical? during these times? Um, well, I think it's uh, pretty much the same recommendations that I would have for any type of uh, mixed marriage, you might say, uh, <laughs> of this type. Right. And it's a matter of good strategies for communication. So, for example, you have 
I guess I, I live in a mixed marriage too. I'm autistic and my wife isn't. So when we communicate, we need to make sure that uh, we understand each other, maybe talk about some things that other couples would assume that the other person would just automatically understand. And when you're having conversations, who says that you have to be sitting across from each other face to face and making eye contact? Can you talk side by side, for example? Um, why not talk in a dark room? Who says it has to be lit? And there are others, for example, other couples who will communicate better by using, by using chat. So they may be sitting together side by side, typing into a, a chat box on, a, on computers. They might be in separate rooms. They might even be in separate countries. Mm -hmm. So that's just one example. Right. Yeah. Distinguishing, I, I mean, this whole Asperger's autism, Asperger's what, no longer appearing in the DSM. Could you just sort of clarify that when this change in terms occurred and why? Oh, yeah, I certainly can. Okay. Uh, well, the, uh, the DSM-5 was uh, released in 2013, and that's when Asperger's syndrome was removed as a diagnostic criteria. Uh, some reason um, for that. Uh, were that uh, the uh, DSM committee felt that maybe people were spending too much time trying to differentiate the boundary between Asperger's syndrome and high-functioning autism, for example. And mm -hmm. I guess I'm a pretty good example of that because most people consider me as having Asperger's syndrome. Likewise, mm -hmm. I do too. <laughs> uh, however, since I lost functional communication at 18 months, and didn't start getting it back until four years of age, that says autism. Because with Asperger's syndrome, you cannot have a uh, significant delay in verbal interaction, which I did. So I'd have to call myself autistic and not Asperger's. But it, it never really mattered to me because uh, they're both on the autism spectrum. Right. So that's one positive reason. They also included uh, the presence of sensory issues. I have yet to meet an autistic person who doesn't have sensory issues. I have one friend on the spectrum who says he doesn't have sensory issues, but I wonder why the lights are off in his house and the shades are down. <laughs> now, that, now, now yeah. that said, yeah. uh, the, uh, what may have happened is that the autism spectrum, as it's now called, it's become a little bit too wide for its own good because there's such incredible diversity within the autism spectrum from someone who might have formerly been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome to someone who has some really significant challenges in communication and many other uh, support needs. And that's why I think having that subtype of Asperger's syndrome was pretty helpful. And I think it still is because seven years later, in 2020, we're still using the word Asperger's syndrome and it got erased as a diagnosis. So maybe in the future, uh, it will come back. Right. Uh, one quick last one, because the hour is about up. Some people, okay. I, some people I know equate autism with being mentally deficient or mentally challenged. What do you think I should say to these people? Uh, I said, uh, uh, in, the, in the early days, say from the 40s to the 60s or so, it was thought that if you were autistic, you had an 80% probability of also having, they called it mental retardation, then now it's called intellectual disability. Mm -hmm. What we realize now is that there is not necessarily a correlation between being autistic and your intelligence. Um, also, the concept of IQ, I think, is also a, a little bit suspect because um, I know autistic people who have ridiculous IQ scores, both at the high end, um, but they still have significant challenges. And also at the other end, where it measures out at room temperature or even freezing temperature, those of us who are, use Fahrenheit, 
But mm-hmm. somehow they're communicating, somehow they're giving conferences, presentations, somehow they're writing and traveling. So I'm not sure what that number at the end of an IQ test means for an autistic person. Mm-hmm. Well, that was excellent. The hour is up. And I uh, wanted to thank you again for being here and clarifying so many issues. Uh, and of course, during this time of COVID, it, I thought it was really excellent. And thanks well, thank again. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for having me. And I look forward to when we work together again. Yes, you bet. And I just wanted to thank everyone who attended today's webinar and to raise uh, the flag about um, next week's webinar on July 20th when Dr. Sarah Vincent will talk about cultural considerations when diagnosing and treating ADHD in African-American children. I want to be very enlightening. So thanks everyone for being here and have a great day. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit AttitudeMag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-Mag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-Mag.com.